Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hey. How's it going? I'm good. You good? Yep. I was thinking, we have been talking about a lot of things in sort of separate conversations and with different types of audiences that I think are all connected. <clears throat> and I, I want to talk about them a lot, um, a lot more. So we've been talking a lot about uh, whether or not a person's thinking abilities are sort of set from birth, whether or not we can get better at thinking, fixed no, versus... yes. <laughs> right. But what, so we've talked about that. Then we talk about like fixed versus growth mindset. And we just, we... We talk about the same thing, I think, but using different words a lot. Yes. So I wanted to kind of bring them all together in a conversation with you for everyone. Yes. Right? So it reminded me of several years ago, gosh, several years ago, many years ago, we were at a, um, a pretty small a pretty small school district, K-8 to school, and I think we were doing an assembly for students between kindergarten and third grade inside of their gym slash cafeteria space. Oh, yeah. And I remember we were talking to these kids, which are, who were all wonderful and are all now probably in college. They're probably now. adults. I know, yeah. it's so scary. Um, but anyway, I think we started out by asking them, uh, what does it mean to think? How do you think? Yes. And one little girl raised her hand and she goes, oh, that's easy. Our brain just does it. And she's like, you know, like my heart just beats, my brain just thinks. And it was a really interesting answer for both of us, I think, at that moment. Because like, oh, it it gives us insight into sort of the dominant way that people think, which is we either have a natural ability to think or we don't. We're either born dumb or smart or intelligent or not. We're lifelong learners or we're not. That it's that is kind of static. Absolutely. Or fixed. That's the dominant opinion of the brain, in, yeah. uh, the intellect, intelligence, thinking, all, all of the above. Well, and it's not just kids that believe that. Oh, for sure. So we corrected the kids in that assembly. We said, no, actually, you know, your, 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 your ability to think is something you can get better at. You can work at it just like you work at playing baseball or yeah. basketball or any of those things. So I wanted to l talk about this idea of fixed mindset and why why it sort of is dominating in the way that we think about a lot of things. Like we're either a natural, you know, we're born as a good athlete, we're born as a good thinker, we're born into whatever set of skills we have. Like why do we think that? And then how do we, what do we do about that? How do we move us to a different place? Like what's the mental model we have to debunk? Yeah, I mean, I, w I would say that it's, um you know, one could say that it's because of the IQ test, you know, that gives people the impression yeah. that you have a certain IQ and that IQ really doesn't change. You say, you know, Einstein had an IQ of, you know, they don't say Einstein got a higher IQ over time or anything like that. Right. I would say that except for the fact that you actually hear these kinds of statements all the time. People say, oh, I'm not good at math as if that's a the set in stone. People say, you know, I, I notice young people saying all the time, oh, I just, I'm not good at this sport. Right. You know, I'm not good at chess. Right. I'm not good at whatever. As if, as if, well, you just missed the birth lottery yeah. on chess, right? And you either got the chess gene or you didn't get the chess gene. Or you got the basketball gene or didn't, or you got the lacrosse gene or you didn't, or you got the, you know, intelligence gene or you didn't. And I think I think it doesn't it's not just limited to intelligence or to thinking or cognitive things. I think yeah. it's limited it, I think it's kind of a global way that we think about ourselves is like it kind of permeates. Yeah, it kind of permeates our if we're not immediately good at something, which by the way, none of us no. are really immediately good at anything very few of us uh you know i guess there's the anomalies that you know have a sudden yeah. and immediate you know yeah. talent yeah but that is absolutely the anomaly the the you know the rare case yeah where people just sort of seem good at something from, yeah. from day one and the truth is just like there's you know <laughs> show me an overnight success and i'll show you somebody that's been working at it for a lot of years the truth is 
um, you know, the, the people that consistently work at things mm -hmm. get better. Right. And so I think the growth mindset is such important research that Carol Dweck did. Um, it's such important research, mostly because it says something really basic. It's very basic, but it's really important, which is you can get better at things. Right. And, it's, and not just like, you know, cognitive things, but, you know, all things. Right. And I mean, it is basic in concept, but it is something that nobody really realized. Right. Like Carol Dweck came up, came came onto the scene and said, you know, because up to that point, the predominant thing was you're either naturally good at something or you're not. And I think her work was sort of a step forward in saying, oh, well, actually, we can characterize people this way or that way, and you can become yeah. this way. Yeah, I would say, I, I, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say nobody really realized. I think yeah. lots of people realized. I think what, you know, um, science, science is a really interesting thing. And I, the general public can sometimes get frustrated with science for good reason. One, it seems like we're changing our mind all the time. Yeah. What, when actually, what we're doing is learning. Yes. Um, and so, yes, we are changing our, our mind because we're getting more and more data or more things are coming to light. And that's the whole point of science. Right. Um, the other thing that can be frustrating about science is you'll, you'll read, you know, I think sometimes the general public reads things like, you know, new scientific research proves, you know, broccoli is good for you or something like that. Right. Yes. And you're like, oh, didn't we already know that? You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, I think we can somewhat cherry pick things that that we sort of say, yeah. I think most people knew that already, but science just showed it, right? With data and ex experimental or empirical evidence shows it. And what we fail to see is all the things that we took as an assumption that science did not find the empirical data for. Right? right. That makes sense. So we there's these things that we think are absolutely going to be, you know, we assume they're true and it turns out they're not true. So sometimes science kind of science doesn't really prove anything. It just gets more and more. Yeah. Like it sure, validates validating. It gets of, better over time. Yeah. More accurate, I guess you would say. Yeah. And so I guess that's all a long way of saying that what Carol Dweck did was take something that a lot of people felt like they knew. And now we really know it. Like now we have the empirical data um, that are our, our basic common sense assumptions about some things mm -hmm. turns out to be true. But a lot of people didn't think that. A lot of people, like we started the podcast with, you know, the majority of people don't think that. Think what? What are you referring to? They don't think that you that you can grow and, oh, and get, better. get better, right? They think, like we were talking yeah. about, they think, oh, I was born a particular way yeah. and that's pretty much how I'm going to be. So I might as well find a career that fits what I'm right. naturally good at. Right. And if I happen to not be naturally good at anything, then I'll, you know, kind of navigate through life that way. But in reality, you can get good at almost anything with practice with and practice. with well i think it's not just practice i think it's i think it's motivation to change mm -hmm. plus knowing what to practice plus mm -hmm. the attention and effort to actually work to get better at something yes like carol dweck's work talks a little bit about you know motivation like how we can mo yes. how we can see the difference between a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset has a lot to do with the level of motivation yes. that people have. That fixed mindsets sort of because they're fixed, they believe they're in a good spot, right? yes. and they don't have a an impetus or uh, an awareness of a need to change. Right? Yeah, I was watching a thing the other day on uh, I, I'm not going to remember the coach's name, but I'm sure you can look it up or something uh, on the internets. <laughs> But it was saying that um, this it was this like famous lacrosse coach or lacrosse coach player, oh, pretty yeah. famous guy, and I guess he was running a camp mm -hmm. for young people for yeah. like you know high schoolers, and he goes, you know, if I could guarantee you today that you could get into a, a D one, a Division one lacrosse school, and play in college, would would you all? How many of you would be interested? And all the kids raise their hand, right? And he goes. All right, I'm going to tell you exactly how. And they're all ears, right? Yeah. And he says, 
shoot a hundred shots a day into the net. Every day. Every day. Yeah. That's all you got to do is shoot a hundred hundred shots. But here is the catch. You can't miss a day. <laughs> Doesn't matter if it's raining, snowing, sleet, you're sick, you're tired, whatever. You can't right. miss a day. Interesting. And so is it really about the 100 shots? Sure, it's a, shooting's a big part of the game, stick control, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But what it's really about is the dedication that it would take to not miss a day. Yeah. Right? And the consistency that it would take to not miss a day. And that would be co-located with a bunch of other qualities, you know, yeah. and characteristics, right? And so, you know, it's it's an interesting story that that sort of makes it very clear that really anybody could probably do anything. And, you know, if if you're willing to sort of put that much dedication and discipline and practice and and, yeah. and you know, yeah, effort, right? And and it seems like. You, what you said, discipline, like what what that what that advice is actually testing is the dedication, the motivation, the discipline, the uh, practice, the tenacity, the tenacity, yeah, the, the goal state, the grit, because that's what's going to matter. <laughs> yep. Because everybody can develop their skills, yes, but you can't develop character. You can't. I mean, like you can develop character, but people, you can change skills, yeah, through practice. But character is something that actually takes a little bit more. Uh, what's the word? Character seems like it's behind the scenes, but it is something that can be developed, right? And it can be developed through some pretty specific things, like you're saying, like discipline, Absolutely. motivation, tenacity. Yeah. Um, Challenge, and small wins over time, you know, yeah. that's how you develop it. You know, I think about this whole idea of growth mindset and no no challenge, no change, no discipline, no freedom, like yeah. all these kinds of things that we talk about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think if somebody came to us and said, well, how do I, how do I get better? How do I improve? You know, how do I become more flexible? At what? Just, you know, in my approach to things, in my approach to life, in my approach to work, and in my approach to my family, how do I, how do I, be, how do I build that kind of flexibility in the way that I think about things? You know, like, how would we, how would we advise somebody to get better? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a good question because people want to get better at a lot of different things, right? You want to get better at lacrosse, you want to get better at yoga, you want to get better at like you know your work yeah. or whatever it is that you're interested in, right? Quilting or something, yeah, skateboarding, uh, fashion, you know, what whatever it doesn't really matter. Making coffee, yeah, and so there's a nearly infinite world of things that people want to get better at, and. Um, the question is, uh, as a general question, how do you get better at anything, mm -hmm. I think, is very much related to thinking. How so? Right? Because, because, and I think this is a connection that a lot of people probably won't make right away, is that before you can do it, you have to think it. Uh -huh. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're doing a, a, a weight training routine and you're kind of, you're feeling stuck but you don't know how to get unstuck. Well, the thing that's gonna get you unstuck is a different thought. Oh, that's interesting. Right, if you're feeling like you're not making the progress that you wanna make in yoga, well, the thing that's gonna get you unstuck from that from that you know path yeah. is thinking a different thought. Yeah, it's like when you say to me, you say to me and you said before to the kids, like, if you think you can't, yeah, then you can't. Then you can't. Yeah. Well, that's that's one aspect of it. Like what what you think is going to manifest in action and behavior. Mm -hmm. But but I mean, if you if you can't think differently about your routine, if you can't think differently about way the way you do tasks, the way you manage your day, the way you sleep, if you can't think differently about those things, then you can't really do much different. That's right. And in that sense, there is no change. Mm -hmm. So. Thinking is the thing that drives the change. Thinking is the thing that changes the mental model so that you can see the possibility of something different. That that you could even that you could do it differently than the guy on the yoga tape tells you to do it. Oh, okay. Thinking is the thing where you go, huh, my body doesn't like it the way he showed it. So. But maybe I could figure out a way to do it in a way that my body does, you know, because my hip joint's a little different than somebody else's hip joint. Well, that thought, if you don't have that thought, 
then you're just going to keep trying it the way the guy on the tape does it. Right. You're just right? going to keep doing it over and over and you're going to get more frustrated because you're trying to do it in the way that somebody else. That's right. Right. And so. If you can't see it, and by see it, I mean see it with the mind, then you can't manifest it. Right. So if you want to get better, getting better fundamentally is about change, mm -hmm. change over time. Right. If you want to get better, you got to be able to think better because because all of those changes have a parallel change in the mental model. All of those physical changes in the real world, at whatever of those infinite things that you want to get better at, have a parallel change in the mental model that's in the mind before you see the change in the body or in the action or in the ability. Right, because it's the mental models that lead to the behavior. Yes. Right. I think a lot of people miss that connection. Like we think we have a mental model and it's just like a static thing. It's a mental model. But every mental model you have, I well, maybe not every, but your mental models are what shape your choices. They shape your decisions. They they change your behaviors in certain yeah. situations. They can change how you think about yourself. That's right. So what you're saying is if you can't if you can't be open to the fact that you, you can think differently about something to bring about the ability to change it, mm -hmm. then you're sort of a non-starter. Exactly. I mean, I think about, um, you know, we tell our students a lot the story of my to-do list, my mental model of my yeah. to-do list, right? Exactly. So, like, I was struggling because I had these to-do lists and, you know, have a to-do list every day. And it can be long at points. And... I was struggling feeling like I, I had the mental model that I was working really hard and not accomplishing much. But then when I sort of challenged the way I was thinking about it or had a different thought about it, right, I, I sort of shifted my perspective on it and said, well, let's focus on the part of the list that I got done, mm -hmm. right? And, and noticing that, you know, and, and having the mental model that, A, my list is long, and B, I should be celebrating what I've done rather than what I haven't done because then it encourages me to keep doing, right? Otherwise I feel discouraged or like I'm just not getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like that shift in the mental model of like, instead of to do to like to done, then I'm like, oh, I'm making progress, mm -hmm. right? And also changing my expectations of myself. Like nobody can have 22 things in one day. Like I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, pick the top three to five. Right. So that's what you're, is that what you're talking about? Like thinking differently or changing the way I'm thinking to change my behavior and my, I don't know, the way I approach things. Yeah. So there's a couple of things in what you're saying, like that, that, um, that are pretty important. So you have a mental model mm -hmm. of your to-do list. Right. And your to-do list and, and your initial me mental model is that you're not getting you have so much to do and you're not getting enough done. So mm -hmm. you you sort of have the ability to question that mental model and say, is that you know a good mental model or is it yeah. true or something? But then the problem is there's a lot of advice out there. True. Right. And those, that advice is somebody else's mental model that's going to influence you. So, right. for example, there's a whole world of advice out there about positive thinking uh, versus negative thinking. And 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 again, I just fundamentally disagree with all that advice, all, all the positive and negative and all that. Interesting. All those labels that we put on things. What I want to know is what's real. If oh. I was you, I would want to know what's real. Am I getting a lot done or am I not getting a lot done? Yeah, I like that point. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's better. So so I don't really care if I can put a positive spin to make myself feel better. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of a form of cheating. Right? Yeah. yeah. So what I want to do is, is understand, am I getting a lot done or am I not getting a lot done? And how do I determine what's a lot and who am I measuring against or what am I measuring against? And I want to know the reality yeah, like that. of my to-do list. Right. Right. And so it's not about let's look at to done because I'm going to feel better. Right. It's it's let's look at how much I have to do, how, you know, how many hours worth of work that is. Yep. Let's look at what I got done and what I didn't get done, what I had planned for the day versus what I completed. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And then maybe maybe it's just a matter of adjusting my expectations. Yes. Right. Because I, what I want to do is plan for the day and and like, you know, come somewhere near mm -hmm. what my plan was, because if I plan for the day that I'm going to get 20 things done and then I only end up getting 10 of those things done, what that is, is that's reality giving me feedback that I was 50% off or 100% off. Yeah, that's right? right. That's right. So I want to take that feedback and say, oh, okay, well, tomorrow I'm not going to, I'm not going to set that trap for myself. I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to plan on getting 10 things done. Because the reality is reality. Because the reality right. is and reality. And I can trust the pattern of what I can get done yes. realistically. Yes. And what I can't. Yes. And, and, I like the way you said that better. Like, what's real yep. versus, and I, I didn't mean to imply, just put a positive smear on it, but I understand why it sounded that way. But I like the idea of, okay, well, what's realistic? Yes. The, the word realistic is based in reality. Like, yes. what is real? What can I get done? Is my initial mental yeah. model, which is I'm, like, not getting enough yeah. done, I'm a loser, you know, whatever. Yeah. Is that a reasonable mental model? Like, you might be a loser, it's possible. You might be, like it's it's entirely possible. I don't, think, yeah. I don't think you are either. I'm just saying, I'm saying if I was a loser, yes, and if I was practicing the art of being You'll a loser, be sure. I would want to know. Well, yeah, I want to know that. Everybody I want to be the first one to know. Yeah, because if I don't know, then there's a near guarantee that I will continue. I won't be changing it because I don't know. Exactly. That. Right. I exactly. Like so, I, and I don't mean like you know, that if you don't get a lot done, you're not you're a loser. I'm just saying, I'm saying if that's your mental model, because you 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 built the mental model. Yeah. And a lot of times we are the most unkind to ourselves. That is true. Right. We are the most unkind to ourselves, and and that's another whole mental model of like, if you, if if someone talked to you, yeah, like you talked to you. And I mean you, like all of us, right? Like our self-talk. Yeah. If yeah. if someone, if an outside, if you, if you're somebody you love, you know, and you're watching, and yeah. somebody else came up and talked to them the way that they talk to themselves, you'd be like, yeah. What? Why the hell are you talking to her like that? You know, like you're not allowed to talk <laughs> to her like that, yeah. right? But it, because it's you, we then we, it, we, think, we, we just, think it's okay. We think it's okay. Yeah, that's right. Right. That's right. So what we want to do is test those mental models. That's that's the key and love reality. Yeah. And and let the chips fall where they may. Let the chips fall where they may. If you're not getting enough done, okay, what do we have to do? We have to distinguish what is enough. Yep. What is done? Who who are we measuring against or what are we measuring against? Is a task a task? Right. Is a task a task a task, right? Because yeah. sometimes you have really big tasks, sometimes you have very small tasks. I mean, going mm -hmm. picking up shoe polish is a little different than uh, I don't even have shoe polish, but <laughs> I don't know why I said that. But you know, because it's a simple task. Yeah, you know, picking up something at the store is a little different than running a whole project. Yes, and those could both be check marks on the same list. No, that's a good. That's a good point. A fair point too. Yeah. So like we have that. to make distinctions. We let, need to look at the relationships. We need to look at the part whole systems. We need yeah. to take different perspectives so that we can assess the veracity, the validity, the reliability of the mental model that we have. Meaning the degree to which our mental model matches how things actually are in the world. Yeah. Right. So, you know, the reality is, I have at, at that time I had I believed I could do far more than I should have to believe I can do as a human being, right, with yes. limitations. So the reality is, you know, there's a certain number of hours in the day right. that you can work. And I don't believe in beliefs. Well, So, you know, <laughs> whenever I have a belief, I don't. I just, I know. The one belief I have is not to have beliefs because beliefs, you know, what are beliefs? Beliefs are just – beliefs are just – really stubborn mental models. Okay, let's slow down for a second. I love that. Beliefs are really stubborn mental models. Yeah. Okay. That's all it is. Like, Say more. A, a belief is just a mental model that you have sanctified or frozen in time and you've decided that you're not going to allow that mental model to change. And I think those are the worst kind of mental models. A mental model that is not changeable. Yeah. 
is a really terrible mental model. That means that you've decided like, I'm not going to learn when it comes to this thing. So what do you do about that? Don't have beliefs. Well, how do you not have beliefs? Be agnostic to beliefs. But how, how do you do that? I mean, you just- You have mental models. Yeah. And you, you have mental models for the time that you have them and you're willing to change them. Yeah, that's- Nothing is permanent. Everything is, you know, you never dip your toe into the same river twice. Yeah. I love that. I think that's amazing. You, 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 you know, it might look like the same river, but it's different water, right? So, so your mental models are fluid. They're moving. They're changing based on new information, based on changing contexts. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to have a, an ability with mental models like DSRP that lets you be fluid with the changing context, the changing situation, the new information, mm -hmm. you know, a belief is just sort of saying, I'm going to stubbornly persist in this mental model, regardless of any incoming feedback or, right. you know, in, in input from reality. I'm just going to stay with this one because. Well, do we stay with them because we believe they're sort of part of our identity or who we are? Or like, why would we stay with them? Just because it's yeah, easy? Yeah, it could be identity, could be. Yeah, it could you could be mistaking that with your with your self yeah. concept or your self identity, uh, which happens all the time. I mean, yeah. identity politics and identity. Yeah, you know, identity is a big big topic of conversation today, um, and identity is really important. But like everything else, it changes. It you're you're, you're not going to be the same identity when you're 20 as you are when you're 25 or 30 or 35 yeah. or 40. Yeah. You're not even going to be the same identity when you're in different groups. That's right. It shifts. It shifts, right? Yeah. Like if you go home, you know, to your family mm -hmm. or versus, your, you know, if let's say you're at college and you go home on Thanksgiving or something, you're yeah. different with your family than you are with your friends. You're different yeah. with your mates. Yeah. Because here you're, you're a child and here you're a young adult yeah, exactly. trying to be independent. Yeah. Or if you're a, a dad. You know, you're different when you're around your kids than you are when you're at work, than you are when you're coaching, than you are whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So your identity is itself fluid in the moment. That's right. It's always changing. It's always changing. Based on the relationship you have with everything else around you. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You were talking when you were talking about the never putting your toe in the mm. river twice. Yeah. I had this fleeting thought, which is. That's not me, by the way. That's I think that's Heracles or something. Yeah. Some we some Greek dude. That. Heracles. Yes, Heracles. Sorry. Well, that was really that was close. good. That was close. <laughs> it seems to me there there are sort of naturally occurring without you realizing it kind of fast reality based feedback. Like you put your hand on a hot stove and it's yeah. hot and you yeah. bring and you push your hand off. That's sort of. I don't want to say automatic, but it's sort of you're not purposely seeking that feedback. The world is giving you that feedback yeah. versus, hey, I realize that I'm stubborn in this belief and I want to change that. That's more like, don't you think that requires more awareness of it and a purposeful effort on my part to start to challenge that belief? Like we talk a lot about not creating echo chambers. Around yes. Us. Yes. To me, those two things are kind of different. I don't know what you think about in that. In terms of feedback? Yeah, like one one is you're going to get feedback from the world. Yes. You're going to bump up against the world or against the heat or against Yeah, I guess whatever. you can choose to see it or not. Yes. But this one seems more um, purposeful. Like, I know I want to, to get my mental model about X closer to the reality of X because something's not working. More conscious. Yeah. And less reactive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's the same feedback process. But it is you, you do have a little bit more consciousness there. More you have to have like a, a you have to be introduced to the mental model that that you could have a belief that is very permanent. And oh, yeah. you, then when you change that, then you can be on the lookout for beliefs. That's interesting. Yeah, you know, like so. For example, you might this might be a new mental model to you. This idea mm. that beliefs might not be a you know a terribly yeah you know thing a thing that you want a lot of and um and so you you might spend the day mm -hmm. for the very first time thinking about oh 
I didn't even notice that's a belief that I have. Yeah. Or, oh, that, there's another one. And, oh, wow, I have a lot of these things. I have a lot of these things I call beliefs. So I'm thinking about an outcome of a mental model. Like you get, you get a, a result out in the real world that's not what you really want. Mm -hmm. Well, that's feedback that something about your mental model is wrong. Yes. Right? But the, the point is you have to be, you have to be conscious enough to see that feedback that the world is giving you to then question your mental model, right? Yes, that's why metacognition is so important because metacognition right. is gonna make you a little bit more aware of, of things and have like a, a, you know, a third eye that's looking at yeah. yourself and your own processing a little bit so that you can go, oh, you know, I, see, I sort of see this as being, you know, Jean Goodall was this amazing scientist, poster child of science and, yes. uh, and and, you know, all she did really was just she was insatiably curious and mm -hmm. she watched primates, mm -hmm. was the founder of primatology and yep. the whole discipline. And, um, you know, but she just observed. Yeah. You know, she was this amazing observer. And, and some of the great scientists were just these amazing observers like Darwin. Um, and and she observed she observed and just think of how much we know now about primates yeah. of which we are one and, yeah. and, and how much she taught us about ourselves from just taking the time to observe, mm -hmm. right? Well, imagine if you just took, you know, a couple thousand brain cells, which is a, a tiny yeah. amount and, and just made them your observer of yourself third eye thing yeah of yourself think, and yeah. just just sort of say hey you guys you're gonna your job from now on is just pay attention to this thing mm -hmm. yeah yeah it doesn't cost you hardly anything right you've got 90 billion of these things so right. so it doesn't cost you anything to take a few hundred thousand of them and throw them on on observation yeah and you're gonna learn a lot about yourself and you're going to learn a lot about how you take feedback, right? Because if you if you have a belief mm -hmm. that is stubborn, yes, right, and you've got your identity wrapped up in it, and maybe even your ego and your hubris and all kinds of things wrapped up in that belief being right, mm -hmm. then then when you get feedback from reality from the world, you might notice that it's feedback. But you're going to respond very differently to it. You're going to push it away. Yeah. You're going to you're going to have 17 reasons why it's wrong. You're going to have all kinds of deflecting because it's challenging. Yeah, you're going to build a castle around this belief, and it's going to have a moat, and it's going to have a drawbridge, and like <laughs> it's going to be hard to alligators. <laughs> and, you know, you're like, this is my belief. I've got to protect this thing. Yeah. You know, so any feedback that's incoming, we're going to yeah. fight. We're going to fight back. Judo it away, yeah. like curl yeah. and chop it away. I'm like, you know, tear down the walls. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think, I think that's right. Like that whole. I mean, I don't love the concept of like this third eye on my shoulder looking around. But you know, they say head on a swivel. Yeah. Like I don't know, is that a military thing? Yeah. Head on. Special forces. I mean, that's. I I guess to me, that's kind of the point. Is I don't want to say force yourself, but. But purposely try to see more. Purposely try to see and take in the feedback that the world's giving you or that people are giving you and allow it in so that you can, um, like you said, tear down that wall. Like maybe consider that that mental model could be adjusted to better fit the reality. Why don't you like the eyeball? It's a little creepy for me. Something. But it doesn't have to be over here. It could be like here. That's even creepier. Well, you can have it wherever you want. It can be inside your head. <laughs> okay. So I'll Just think of like there's, yeah, a, there's a couple hundred like thousand alien. neurons that are looking at your other neurons. I can handle that. It's like an audience yeah. of neurons. And like you go up and you get, grab a group of them in section D. <laughs> and you go, hey, section D, you guys watch everybody else. And tell us what's happening. And tell us what's going on. That I can handle. There was something about the little, the it's like alien-ish, no. you know, like the little thing on my shoulder is like, yeah, no, and then when it, it like to... starts to bite my face or, you know. That's, yeah. It made me think of alien. <laughs> okay. I, well, yeah, just 
part of the audience looking at the audience. I get it. Yeah. The meta. The meta. The meta. The meta audience. The meta audience. Interesting. You could have them in a little box in the stadium. That I kind of like. Right? Yeah. And they're like, their job is to kind of be like, oh, how are the other yeah. crowd, how's the rest of the crowd interacting with each other? And how's the rest of the crowd perceiving the game? And then they report back to you. Yeah, they're just doing the like marketing studies. <laughs> on your life. On your life and, <laughs> and your processing. That's actually kind of funny. Yeah. I can picture that now. Yeah. As funny as it is, I mean, the point stands, right? Like, you, you should be looking around, searching out for that sort of feedback and not doing the karate chop away. Yeah. I like the idea. I, I do think that it's a really fascinating idea that stubborn beliefs are just like these mental models that we have to be willing to sort of examine and sort of crack open. Like I hadn't thought about that. Well, before. all beliefs are stubborn. They're stubborn mental models. All so a belief stubborn. is a stubborn mental model. It's, it, all it is is a mental model. But you, that is stubborn. Yeah, I get that. But can't you have uh, beliefs that are actually good, like positive? Like my belief, like your belief to be ethical? That's a belief. Mm -hmm. Is that stubborn? I don't think of it as a belief. I think of it as that uh -huh. my, my, my form of ethics comes from watching nature. And it, it, to me, it is, it is what nature has shown me is the case. Say more. I don't know what you mean. Uh, well, nature, nature kind of works in ecologies, right? So, yeah. so, um, there's a, so the, in the Northern Natal, the, the tribes, people there, they have a, um, they have a greeting. Yeah. Right. And, and the greet, you know, they say, Hey, how you doing? What's up? Yeah. But they say it a little differently than we say, they say, Sawabona, right? Mm -hmm. And. And the reply is Sakona. Mm -hmm. And what that means is, um, I see you. The greeting is, I see I you. I see you. Yeah. And the reply is, therefore I exist. Oh, I like that. So it's a very nice greeting, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and it's a greeting that I think is, is baked into into nature, which is not, not in the sense that everything in nature isn't, you know, pretty metal and, and yeah, yeah. pretty... Uh, pretty it can nature can be quite harsh mm -hmm. but but nature understands that everything relies on everything else that that, that everything yes. is interconnected and that that your identity is intertwined with the other and that that we exist in the identity exists in the other and vice versa yeah and another way of saying that is there is no us without them and there's no them yeah. without us and them is us over here right. looking at you right and you're them right so so um so that's an example of an ethic that is the identity other distinction ethic yeah the i the part whole system ethic is is the idea that we are all part of something there, yes. no man is an island as they say um and uh that we are part of some wider context Mm -hmm. Right. We can't divorce ourselves from our context. So that's an ethic that I think, you know, plays out in science all the time when we divorce our data from when we yes. when we surgically remove these these variables, studies yeah. or these variables from their context. I think that's like unethical because the, the findings are wrong. Right. Because those things exist in that because reality, they exist that, in context. that context. Yes. Exactly. You can't divorce. Right. It. Yeah. So. Um, and, and we're all together in an ecology and interconnected, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the relationship ethic. The fact that relationship is made up of action-reaction, Newton's law, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and DSRP, the R is relationship and action-reaction, is that our actions have consequences. So that's an ethic that yeah. you can live by. And that, that's, that's what I see in nature, and, right. and perspective is point and view that, you know, you can see things a certain way, but some, some other organism yeah. in the ecology is seeing that thing differently. And who's right? But, you know, there's no right, wrong, whatever. There's, there's difference. Yeah. And that's real. And that's real. Yeah. And those, and those, so those are real ethics 
that have real um, manifestations, but they, but I I don't believe in those things. I, if you showed me nature acting in a, in a completely different way than those things, mm-hmm. um, and I, again, you know, uh, nature can be can appear yeah. incredibly uh, violent and you know unfriendly and unkind. Yeah, do you remember Mutual of Omaha? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a <laughs> There's a, uh, I think it's an Instagram, there's a thing, nature is metal. Oh, really? Which is like, you know, really hardcore stuff. See, your example is much more modern than mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's basically mutual of Omaha. But, mutual of Omaha is like but, from the 70s. Yeah, that's an old one. And it was like Nobody shocking. Know what that is. It was shocking to watch <laughs> was, like a lion eat a baby animal yeah. and the guy being like, this is how nature works. Yes. Something's a prey, something's a predator. And it's just the way it is, right? Right. Don't judge it. You know? Well, and again, because we're we're focusing in on a particular identity, right? Which is mm-hmm. the lion and the and the and the antelope. Yeah, and we're not seeing that these two species are actually in a codependent dance that one cannot exist without the other. Mm-hmm. So, it you know to to look at that at this level and and divorce it or decontextualize it from the fact that. You know, wolves and elk help each other in Yellowstone. Yeah. Lions and antelope, you know, they help each other. They're coexisting. They're co they're co evolving. Um, you know, that interconnection is is part of the fabric of, of nature. Right. And it's part of the fabric of my mental models. Yeah. And if tomorrow that wasn't part of the fabric, I would change that mental model. Which is why it's an ethic and not a belief. Because you're it's saying, a mental model yeah. ab- about how things manifest in ethical ways. The whole idea of sort of this, um, I think you called it sort of the manifestation of ethic, ethics mm-hmm. inside of nature. I mean, I think that that's something that is not obvious until you hear it. And so I was thinking about the us-them thing, like the identity other, yeah. right? How... You know, the lion, not the lion, the wolf and the, what was the other one? Elk. Elk. The wolf and the elk kind of need each other. And there's yeah. this sort of symbiotic or codependent. Yes. They, they rely on each other. And then you were talking about, you know, us needs them and them needs us and they're mm-hmm. interchangeable. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I find that kind of fascinating because I had never thought about anything like at that level until a while ago. One of my favorite biologists, yeah. her name is Lynn Margulis. Yes. She was um, married to Carl Sagan. That's right. Um, and uh, Lynn Margulis uh, unfortunately passed, but but she, um, she was really instrumental in, so let me back up. Yeah. So there's a thing in biology called a symbiont. Right. A symbiont is a, an organism that is symbiotic, yeah. right? And um, so you take something like lichen. Lichen is a, a lichen like you see on the rocks, yeah. right? Lichen is a, an algae and a fungi together that are that literally are kind of inseparable. They mm-hmm. live together and they they help each other in different ways. The algae produces through photosynthesis um, essentially food for the fungus, and the fungus produces kind of a carapace mm-hmm. of protection like a house for the yeah. algae right yeah it's a win and it's a win-win situation right and um and as a result of that remarkable symbiotic relationship lichen are found all over the planet they're found on the highest mountains you know like really inhospitable environments one place they're not found is in polluted places like cities that's interesting. Um, uh, so that's very interesting that they can live in such harsh environments, but they can't live in, in polluted cities. But in any case... Uh, more on that later. That's more on that later. Uh, so so we used to think that like there was this whole biological you know, world, and then there were the symbionts. There was symbiosis, and it was a small group of, of little critters and things like that that, that were symbiotic. Yeah. What Lynn Margulis taught us uh, is is that symbiosis is not the exception, uh, that it's the norm. I love that. Yeah, yeah that symbio- symbiosis is really something that pervades 
life. <laughs> and that we are all in these symbiotic relationships, these interconnected win-win kinds of relationships. That's, that is life on the planet. There's a great saying that life, actually Lynn Margulis said this, uh, she said, life did not overcome the planet through uh, war, but through networking. Mm-hmm. And that's a form of symbiosis of interconnectedness yeah. and ecology. So, I mean, in other words, life grabbed onto this planet and and made the planet its home. Yes. And it wasn't easy in the beginning. Right. Right. It wasn't easy to homestead this planet. Yeah. And it did and, it through relationships, connections. And it did it through networking, mm-hmm. through essentially, you know, con- interconnection and, and symbiosis. Right. And so... That is an ethic. That's a yeah. form of ethic that we need each other. That, 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 you know, when we look at these, what appear to be, you know, the lion eats the thing. And that, mm-hmm. that doesn't seem, that doesn't sit well with us when we right. look at it. But if we take a different view, because evolution is taking a species level view. They're right. not taking an individual level view. It, it's not taking an individual yeah. level view. It's, it's looking at. You know, at the species level, like the whole system, the whole system connections and the parts. And yeah. So I think when we take a different view, we see different things. You know, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. And um, and and so perspective becomes very important. So what you're what you're getting at, which I think is interesting, is, you know, we talked a lot about mind and nature and and the the relationship between the two. Right. I can't remember who it was. A few Bateson, uh, yeah, who said like we are of nature, um, that nature's in us and we're in nature, and that there's this sort of uh, co-location kind of. Oh, relationship are you talking about Carl Sagan, who said we are stardust? And oh, come yeah, from, yeah, that's which that's is nice. Lynn Lynn Margulis Margulis is the husband. husband yeah. yeah, and and I guess I think I think a lot of times people, humans, mm-hmm. create kind of false um, divides mm-hmm. in things, right? That we, sure. we divorce things that are actually not divorced. Yes. And I don't know why we do that. Maybe it's ease or... Well, because hard. because our basic, our basic structuring, mm-hmm. which this is what DSRP kind of tells us, we want to distinguish things. That's what we do. We distinguish yes. things. But we also lump or group things. We systematize them, mm-hmm. so, right? And just like in calculus, you have sort of integration and differentiation, right? So differentiation is and, and integration. And, and that, that kind of idea of, of separating and also clumping. Yeah. And that is universal, that things are constantly separating, yeah. right? But they're also constantly lumping together. Right. To yeah, survive. To and they're separating us. to identify, to distinguish. And then, and then and then they're clumping together or relating. And then and so that is a fundamental thing that our mind does. Now, the question is, our mind, our mind can sort of rampantly do this. Yeah. So what we have to do is figure out when we're doing it, when we're distinguishing things and when we're clumping, grouping things. Mm-hmm. Which sounds like a very simple thing, right? Yeah. We distinguish something from something else, together. this from yeah. that, and we lump things together, we group things together. And it, 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 there's an old saying in science, actually, that there's two kinds of scientists, splitters and lumpers. Right. Right. So the yeah. splitters are the ones who Divide. split stuff up, yep. and the lumpers are the lump stuff together. And what we, what we need in this new world that we live in, and really what we've always needed, is what I call splumpers. Right. You know, people that are kind of an amphibious they can do fluid both. ability to do both. Right. So they right. can go, they can integrate stuff together and then they can deconstruct stuff yes. into parts and they can go back and forth. That's right. And But, the, but here's the crux. Mm-hmm. Because your mind is so capable of doing this, the question is, when you're doing it, is nature doing it? Mm. And by nature, again, remember, I use the word nature to... To, I think this probably confuses people, but I use the word nature for everything. You know, it just means like this is nature, human nature, all kinds of na- everything's nature. 
You mean like reality? Reality. Like nature yeah. is reality. Nature is reality. Okay. Right. So, so the question is, when we're doing it, is nature also doing it? Is is when we're making distinctions, is the office that we work at also having those distinctions, or or are they figments of our? Are they hallucinations? Right. You know, we're we're getting experience now with AI and its hallucinations. Well, the brain hallucinates all the time, right? We mm-hmm. we make distinctions where there aren't any. We fail to see distinctions where there are. Right. We make groupings where there aren't any. Mm-hmm. And we fail to see groupings when there are. Interesting. So what we want to do is make sure that the distinctions we're making and the groupings we're making are groupings nature's making, that reality's making. And is and if we get in alignment on that, mm-hmm. then the things we do, the actions we take, the predictions we make will work out the way we plan them to. Yeah, so let's let's pull on that balloon string a minute. Yeah. Because to me, I mean, I, I kind of get it abstractly, but <laughs> let's just give an example yeah. of a groupings example. Yeah. So you're saying if we're grouping something together in our mind, yeah. then there should be a corollary grouping in reality or in nature. Let's say that you're working on some really important thing like to, to, to fight against terrorism. Mm-hmm. And... And you've decided that this group of, of, of guys, this cell, mm-hmm. is a cell. And you think that this other one, let's, let's use these, you know. You think that these guys are separate from these guys. Separate potential terrorist groups. Yep, this, okay. is, a, this is a terrorist cell and this is a terrorist okay. cell. But you've, you've, you've kind of said they're separate. So you've made the grouping. You've made the groupings. Well, we want what what would be very important to know is if that's true. I see. Because if they're not separate, then they're communicating. Is is there any channel? In in other words, Mm -hmm. are they separate and there's a relationship? Is there a relationship, or is there no relationship at all? In which case, they're not able to coordinate. Or are they actually the same group in different places? Right, and the reason that matters. Yeah. Is because. If it actually exists like this and you act as if it exists this, this way, then what you do will work. Will work. But if it's actually existing like this yes. in reality, but and you're you, acting. And you're acting like it's this, that's what the you mismatch. do might not work. Or if it exists like this. That's, yeah. And and you think it this doesn't exist, then. Because the way you approach it is going to be totally different. Yeah. Which is why you're saying. Which is why what you just said is if it exists in our minds in one way and in, and in reality another way, right. then there's a problem. So what we want to do is understand what our mind says is real. Mm-hmm. And then we want to test that in reality. We want, to, right. we want to say, how could we know whether these guys are talking or not? Yeah. How could we know whether they, the, whether they are you know, somehow actually a lar- one large group in two places? Or there's two separate groups. Right. What are the ways that I can test right. to find out if my hypothesis right. is is accurate? So you would look for evidence of this relationship, right? You would yeah. look for you look for of evidence of that relationship, and then you would decide: is it there or is it not there? Yep. Or you would look for evidence of similarities of of these identities with similarities of these identities, or something like that. You would right. look for all kinds of things like that to 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 test whether your model was right. And over time, you would get clear on, oh, actually, this, this one is over here, and they are separate, and they're not communicating. And now you can, you can attack that problem as it is in the world. Yeah. You, can atta- you can attack it as, oh, I have two different cells. I need yep. to deal with them. I know they don't communicate. They're not communicating, yep. which means I could do something here that wouldn't get over to here you know, and and vice versa. I could play them off of each other. I could I could do all kinds of things. So when you say mind and nature, what you really mean is mental model and reality. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mind That's and helpful. nature, mental model and reality. And so DSRP, what DSRP does is it is a bridge because DSRP is an organizing. There are patterns of organization mm-hmm. that is that are equally happening in matter physical matter as they are in um, in the mind. Right. And so what we're just trying to do is is increase the probability that the way we're grouping things over here is the way they're grouped. 
Yes. The way we're distinguishing over here is the way they're distinguished. The, the perspectives that we're taking over here are the perspectives that are being taken over here. The, the right. relationships that are happening over here are the relationships that are actually at play over here. I remember a long time ago when we were starting out, you mm-hmm. and I, mm-hmm. I used to I used to tell myself the way I could understand that, because at first that was hard for me to understand when I was learning all of this, mm-hmm. and that was a long time ago, was there's like the verb to yeah. DSRP. The way yes. you think is the verb. I'm distinguishing, I'm systematizing, I'm relating, and I'm taking perspectives. That's the verb part. And then there's the noun part, like this thing is a distinction, it is a uh, system, it yes. is a relationship, and it is a, it can be a perspective. Yes, that's point right. or a view. That's right. So to me, in the early days, that's what that's how I sort of came to understand that concept generally was the noun th- verb. Yeah, like the thinking and the existing. Yeah. Right? Or existence, I should say. Because yeah, there's the verb of the thing of making distinctions. Yes. And then there's the Which noun the of mind. a distinction. Yes. And then there's the noun is verbing. Oh, no. You just, <laughs> the noun is I knew verbing. I was going to get you with that one. Damn it. I well, that's what we were talking mind. about earlier, which is that you never put your toe in the same river twice. Meaning the noun isn't going to yeah. stay. It's not this right. static it's thing. It's changing. It's growth mindset. Right? It's, um, that's a callback. But, but, you know, it's changing over time. Everything's changing over time. Meaning things in in existence or nature or reality are mm-hmm. di- are they're verbing themselves. They're yeah. distinguishing themselves yeah, they're from stuff. other stuff. They're constantly moving. So there's the there's the um, I get what you mean now by noun is verbing. Like your elbows exchanging electrons with the table, and yes. you know, like the, the, your liver is not the same liver every month. No, I get that. I get that now. The noun is verbing. That's yeah. interesting. But you understand in the very beginning. That that can make sense. Yes. Like the yeah. verb, there's the verb to DSRP, to distinguish, yes. to systematize, to relate, to take perspectives. And then there's the noun, which is stuff is a distinction, a system, a relationship, and actually the elements, an identity and an other. Yes. A yeah. point and a view, a part and a whole. And to me, that was sort of the way I started to understand the whole mind nature thing when we right. started with all of this. <laughs> I think that's been a lot for today. Yeah? Yeah. Well, are we done? My head actually hurts a little bit. <laughs> so let's. People say that in our trainings. It stuff. doesn't happen to me often, but the noun verbing thing, and oh, then like, sorry. no, that was good. That was that was a lot. But um, you know, in the gym when you work out and your muscle kind of yeah, hurts. Yeah, it does. Same, it does same. happen. Yeah. It does, but that's how you build the muscle. That's how you build that's the how muscle. You that's how you get swollen in the head. <laughs> I don't think people want to be swollen. You do want to be swollen in the head. Maybe. Not like the head swelling. Not like, you know, you don't want to have intracranial pressure. Right. But uh, but um, you do want to build that muscle. You want to flex those muscles. Use it or lose it. All right. And that, that's a wrap. Mm-hmm.